we're off to a good start. Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about integration testing serverless architectures. So it's actually really great to go after Julian because I'm going to be really zoning in on EventBridge now. He's given us all a good introduction to messaging. Um, so a little bit of intro to me. So I'm a developer at Theodo. I'm sure we've all heard about that now. Um, I've been a developer there for about two years. And over the time, I've worked with a range of clients varying from one week to about six months and touched many different tech stacks. But it became apparent quite quickly that I really enjoyed working with serverless, um, mainly because when people came to us with an idea, it was often the quickest way to go from idea conception to actually launching a product. So I could really focus on writing the code rather than the underlying infrastructure. Last year, I also became an AWS community builder, uh, which many of you may have heard about. Um, but it's a program for people who are really enthusiastic about AWS, and it provides mentorship and um, networking opportunities. And it's not just to do with serverless. It also includes like data science and diff different topics as well. So I would encourage you to have a look at that. At Theodo, we also head up the serverless transformation blog, newsletter, podcast, and the meetup, which I've featured on in a couple of times. We really have like the most up-to-date um, resources there, so do check it out. I think we've all been intro to serverless quite a lot here, so I'll, um, I'll whip through this quite quickly. But what does it mean to me? So to me, it means that we launch quicker, we pay less, and we scale instantly. Um, so as I said, a lot of people come to us and they have an idea. Um, and they want to, they might have limited budget and limited time to get something to market quickly. I really think that serverless allows us to do that. So I can see that the GIF isn't actually moving. It says, explain this to me like I'm five. But yeah, how, how do we achieve a serverless architecture? So of course, we leverage the cloud. So um, AWS, Azure, GCP. Um, I tend to focus on AWS, mainly because it's kind of what, what I know. Um, and also, it holds the largest market share. And just so we're all kind of on the same page, I know we've touched on these services. Um, but throughout this talk, I'll be touching on S3 for our storage, step functions for workflows, DynamoDB for our, um, for our database, Lambda for compute, SQS for our messaging. And then we'll be going right into EventBridge. So I guess to kind of start with the problem, we all kind of know of like the famous monolith. Um, so kind of traditional architectures might be that we start with this beautiful code base, and then the business throws extra um, requirements at us, and the engineering team gets stressed because if we add this one thing here, then it might break this thing down here, or a new developer comes in and thinks we can just add this feature but not realizing that somewhere else there's a dependency on it, and we end up with bugs. And everyone becomes very stressed, <laughs> and the business wants things quickly, and the engineering team builds up tech debt. But at Theodo, we like to use event-driven microservices, which I know we've kind of touched on as well here, um, in order to kind of avoid this problem. So that when the business comes to us and asks for more and more things, the engineering team is actually quite happy to do this. And what this means is that when they come to us with an extra requirement, either it will easily be added into one of our microservices that we already have, or we'll be able to spin up a new service in no time, and, um, and everyone's happy. Just to dig into that a little bit further, um, to dig into like exactly what microservices mean to us, so each one kind of runs as its own app. So we'll use a workshop called Domain Driven Design. We have lots of resources um, on this, um, on the serverless transformation blog. So do check it out later. But using that workshop, we actually define domains that can be um, independent from each other. And we use the term loosely coupled a lot. Um, but effectively, each application uh, within the system doesn't actually need to know about each other. So if we take the classic e-commerce example, we might have an order microservice, and then we might have a payment microservice, and each one doesn't need to know about each other. And also, if you end up with a really large application, you can actually have different small, um, really effective teams working on each microservice. 
um, and each one will have its own data source um, and it will deploy independently. And then the key thing is that if one of the services does fail, the rest of the system hopefully doesn't come crashing down if you did do it correctly. So there's many advantages to work in this way and a key part of it is scalability. And at the heart of all of our serverless applications at Theodo, we tend to use Amazon Event Bridge as our event bus. So in just to quickly kind of talk us through this, um, in this diagram, you can see that the event producer in the e-commerce example might be the order service, which will produce events and put them onto the event bus. And so the event might say order created, and it might have some metadata within it. And when it arrives on the event bus, according to a set of rules, it will send that um, event to one of the consumers, which would be another microservice, such as the payment service, to then um, pick up on that information and use that information um, however it needs to. And so the key thing here is that the consumers don't need to know about the producer and vice versa. And so that goes along with the um, deploying independently and failing independently and therefore being able to scale. So I guess to kind of put a bit of context um, to a client that I worked on, it was a video conferencing client that I worked on for about six months. And this was at the beginning of the pandemic last March. And as, you, as you're probably aware, it was video conferencing, so it kind of went from just having a steady flow of people to just going boom. And they had... Um, on-prem servers and essentially the website couldn't take the load and they weren't able to take advantage of the market at the time. So we were kind of brought in as serverless experts to try and um, help with this and try to take advantage of the market. And so the challenge that we were faced with in March of 2020 was to scale to 250,000 users, to train up existing developers on the project who were all skilled in .NET, and to release quickly to take advantage of the, the market at the time. And EventBridge was the key to success. So to briefly touch on this before we go into how we actually tested our, um, our EventBridge, we had the original system where the code base was over 10 years old. So we obviously were not gonna do a rewrite of that in a, a matter of months. Um, so we need to come up with a clever way to make this work and scale. So we did a migration and EventBridge was at the center of this. So in the new system, we had the EventBridge. And from the old system, we were able to pass events into the new system, such as a user signing up with their metadata uh, to be used by the new microservices that we were spinning up. And so in this example, we had a microservice that was called Chat, so a chat part of the app. And we built that up really quickly. That scaled really well. And we were able to then replace um, the old chat so that it was scalable. And that was kind of how we ended up um, working towards this new scalable system. So to get into kind of the main part of the talk about how we actually test um, these serverless architectures, <laughs> you also can't see the GIF on here, but it kind of shows how you can um, have all your unit tests working really well, but then when it actually comes to the integration test, you realize that when things are actually put together, they might not work so well. Um, so traditionally, I think most of us, I hope, know how to write a unit test. Um, personally, we tend to write our applications in Node.js, and we use a test runner called Jest, and so that is what we're gonna be talking about in, the, this, um, in these slides. However, it can all be translated into whatever language. It's just a testing strategy that can be um, implemented in a different way. So before we dig into how we did it, um, there's kind of the question of do we test on the real infrastructure or do we test using mocks and stubs? So we tend to test on the real infrastructure. So I guess it's kind of like why not? Um, we, want, we want to test on something that's exactly the same as production. And so we tend to test on the real infrastructure. Um, when using mocks and stubs, we might do this for like a failed test case, something that's not normal. So we would need to mock that out because we can't rely on that just happening. Um, 
There's also assumptions that we might make when um, using mocks and stubs that could actually end up causing our test to pass when actually they shouldn't. So we test on the real infrastructure. And how do we do this? Well, um, we actually put this into our CI process. So when we open a pull request, um, we'll spin up a test stack and we do this using CloudFormation and the serverless framework. But again, as we've talked about before, you can use SAM and CDK, um, whatever suits you best. And we'll give it a unique name. So CI27 is the example here. We tend to name this after the ticket number that we're working on. Um, so then it's unique because all of your CloudFormation stacks, they need to have a unique name so that you don't override the top of someone else's. And then once it's been deployed and at this point, we effectively have a copy of the production site ready to go. All of the resources spun up in AWS. We'll run the unit test, followed by the integration test, and followed by the end-to-end -end test. And at the end of this, we'll then tear down the stack in cloud formations. This is then deleting all of the resources that we came up with. And I mean, the reason why we do this is firstly, I think there's a maximum of 500 stacks that you can have open in cloud formation. Um, Secondly, you're just paying for resources if you don't tear it down. So of course, we tear it down at the end of the, um, the CI process. And therefore, it's really cheap to do this as well. So to actually touch on the testing strategy now, we'll take a really simple example. So we've got our e-commerce example again. We've got two microservices. We've got the order service, which has a Lambda, which does some processing, um, which then um, emits an event onto the event bridge, the event bus, which might be order created as we've discussed. And then um, due to the rule that we've defined in event bridge, then the second microservice picks up on this, does some processing within a Lambda and puts an invoice into an S3. But of course, this can be applied to any, um, any use of event bridge. This is just a simple example that we're taking here. And again, just to be clear, we do have um, we do have an article that outlines all of this, and I'm going to be showing a few code examples as well, but all of this is in our um, articles online. So yeah, no need to be like, taking, taking notes. So firstly, um, i am actually got to go back. So just to outline here again, the end-to-end -end test would be that when the Lambda is triggered, that the invoice arrives in S3, which is, is a good test, um, however, if this happens to fail, you wouldn't know that the, whether the problem was in the microservice one or the second microservice. So we want to split this into two integration tests and um, perform these separately. And again, because each microservice um, is effectively in its own code base, you need to put each of the tests into their respective uh, code bases. So they're not kind of running cross code base. It's uh, one test in one service and one test in the other service. So firstly, we want to assert that the event was fired. So we, we want to trigger our Lambda, um, which does so some processing within it, and then it emits the event onto the event bus. Now, to assert that the event was fired, we actually introduce something called an event interceptor. So this is something that isn't part of the actual infrastructure. This is something that we add in for the test because you can't simply just check that the event arrived on the event bus using our test runner. So we use SQS in this case um, to actually pull on the event bus. Sorry. Um, um, so we actually add a rule to the event bus that sends the event to the SQS queue. And then using the test runner, you can pull on the SQS queue to assert that the event arrived. So if the, if the event arrived in the messaging queue, then of course it arrived on the event bus too. Um, so that's how we did that. We kind of had to be clever in doing this because at the time um, we'd kind of written our code and then we were like, oh, we need to test this and we wanted to do it on the real infrastructure, not using mocks. And so this is how we came up with it. And it's actually a really nice way of um, handling this case. And we open sourced it. So, um, so this is great because I'll go through a few code examples of what actually is going on behind the scenes. 
But what you'll actually see is that the client code that you'll be able to write is actually really short because we created a library um, for people to add this to their projects. So the first integration test, um, so this is written in Jest, but I'll talk us through it very quickly. Um, so we, again, we're asserting that the event was fired and that it arrived on the event bridge. So firstly, we're invoking the Lambda um, using the AWS SDK. So the Lambda from the first um, service. And then we are um, waiting for that to come back and calling this get events um, feature. And then we're checking that um, these events actually have the source that we expect order created and so I have this meme because it's a bit like, what the hell is going on? Because we have this get events and to have event with source. Now, this is all coming from SLS test tools, so we'll dig into that now. But I guess why I wanted to show this um, is that the test is actually really simple to write from a client perspective. So firstly, before we actually write this event, we do have this before all. So we're, build, we're essentially building the infrastructure beforehand. And this is all happening in SLS test tools. So before each, um, so before each event, before each test runs, um, we make sure that we have all the infrastructure in place, which basically means the SQS queue on the event bridge. And so you can see in purple is marked the client code, which is kind of the part that everyone will be writing. And then SLS tools is just to talk us behind what's going on behind the scenes. So firstly, behind the scenes, we're setting up the SQS client, which of of course, isn't part of the infrastructure that you already have in place. Um, and to do this, we use the AWS SDK. Um, and we basically just give it a unique name and spin that up. And then we add the event bridge rule to it. So as we said, between the event bus and the consumer, which is our second microservice, um, or in this case, our SQS queue, we have the rule to make sure it actually sends it there. And so that's setting up the event bridge rule using the put rule from the AWS SDK. And then we make the SQS queue the target of the event bridge rule. Um, so you can see that simply we've just added a target using the SQS on, which is um, just a unique identifier for the SQS queue. Um, and then we give it a target ID, which in this case is probably just one, um, but each one needs to have its own separate number. And so now that we've actually set up um, the infrastructure in the build process, what we want to do is call the get events, um, get events method, which firstly, although there's quite a lot of code here, I'll quickly just break it down. So we use the receive message on the SQS client using the AWS SDK to get the messages. And we define the wait time as a certain number of seconds. And anything above zero means that you're long polling because everything's asynchronous. So we need to give it a bit of time to long poll on the SQS queue to actually get the message back. If it was zero seconds, we would call it short polling, and it wouldn't be asynchronous. And then we return the results. So it's just the event that uh, arrived on the event bus and subsequently the uh, message queue. And everything in between is just deleting the message off the queue just to clean up after ourselves. And just lastly, SLS tools is actually comprised of a lot of assertions to help us out. So these are just Jest extenders. So you can see that on the bottom line of the client code, we're expecting that the messages that have come back actually has an event with the source that we expect, order created. And simply, this is just a Jest extender so we pass those two items into it, and we, re we return a pass or a fail um, based on whether there is an event there with that source or not. And so that's the first integration test done. And you'll be glad to know that the second one is actually a lot simpler. Um, so we won't be going on for quite as long as that one. So for the second one, we want to assert that the event was actually received from the event bus so that the, so that the event actually uh, pushed the event to the correct microservice, and that, in this case, our invoice ended up in S3. And so how we do this, we inject the event onto the event bus using one of our SLS tools uh, helpers. And then we just check using Jest that the event actually arrived, sorry, that the file actually arrived in S3. 
And so this is the client code. So we publish the event, which is just injecting the event onto the event bus, and we just um, give it the same event that we had in the first microservice. Of course, we can't actually use the real event that happened in the first microservice because all this code is stored in the second microservice. And then we wait on that to return to see whether um, the S3 bucket actually has the object and that it received with the correct file name. And again, it's another assertion. So to have S3 object with name equal to, we just pass in these parameters um, and we use a jest extender to return a pass or a fail. Um, of course, I'll be sharing these slides with everyone afterwards. So that's both integration tests complete, and that is how we test um, EventBridge. And in SLS test tools, we have the range of assertions and helpers um, to really help us with our development. Many of our clients do actually use it and find it really helpful. Um, I think one guy said that it saved him about a week of work by just writing these tests. So if you are using EventBridge, which I hope that you are in your serverless architectures, then this could be really helpful. And we also welcome uh, contributions because it's quite a young project at the moment. I'd love to have assertions for um, like Cognito, Dynamo, and basically the whole of serverless, which would be great. Um, and you'll be added to the contributors list, so it'd be really cool if people got involved. And yeah, I'd just like to say uh, thank you for listening, and if there's any questions, then yeah, do ask.